start let's start we are live greetings to one and all present here i welcome you all for another session of our research initiative i am sanskriti raje present here on behalf of chipsa crafts a student driven driven research initiative of government institute of forensic science aurangabad the vision of this research hub is to harness the power of mind driven by research innovation creativity and critical thinking for smart and reliable forensic solutions and to accomplish this vision our missions are to and calculate the innovation research processes based on creative and critical thinking second to explore the new avenues of research in forensic science by ideating prototyping and testing to collaborate with various in innovative solutions related to forensic problems presently we have four different wings in our research hub namely event management that will be looking after organizing of different events next wing is publication that will be looking after public publishing of newsletter articles etc we have another wing called as research linkage that will be engaging in research collaboration with different organization again we have it management wing that will be with us with it support and will handle social media platform the initiative has been taken to promote research culture for betterment of the society so today to add up to our research knowledge we have with us mr apura kumar sir sir completed his bachelor's in 2015 and masters in 2017 both in forensic science with specialization in documents and cyber forensic following the masters he joined pitney bowes which is us based organization at pune in 2017 as a junior data scientist in the core machine learning research team he worked for close to one and half years over there on multiple projects in confusing text mining that means natural language processing fraud analyst and computer vision later he moved to an organization cognitive scale which is a subsidiary of microsoft research which is also us best organization in hyderabad and have been there since then majority of the work there has been with professor dr jaydeep ghosh from university of texas austin as a senior machine learning researcher in the domain of building proprietary algorithms on explainable and responsible machine learning models particular to healthcare and finance based industries currently sir is working as an applied machine learning scientist and lead managing a team and working on building and deploying large scale machine learning models with results comparable to state of art research in the domain of finance and healthcare i welcome you sir to this amazing session i would like to make note that attendees can type their queries in comment box and the answers will be directly given by sir now over to you sir uh thanks a lot sanskriti thanks for the lovely introduction hi everyone i hope everybody is doing good i'll just enable my screen share and then i'll start yes sir uh can you guys see the screen yes sir yes sir i hope everybody is doing good in the this covid times and everybody is trying taking care of their health and everything feels pretty weird actually to be on the teacher side of the presentation i don't think it has been long that i was on the other side uh, also doing forensics bachelors and masters and right now i'm here to talk about data science the field that i'm currently in and how does it apply exactly to forensic science so uh thanks a lot for inviting me again now uh, at at any given point of time if you if anybody has any questions you can just directly post it on the channel or uh at the end of the presentation i have dedicated some time for the q and a session so anybody who has any questions can then maybe ask at the later time so yeah uh before we uh dig deeper and start this whole uh data science what exactly is data science and how what is the application of data science in forensics i'll just give you an outline of what we will be dealing with today so uh i like to 
present everything in the form of questions because at the end of the day if we know what questions are we asking and we have an answer to them it's that's pretty much clear to what exactly are we trying to talk about over here and when i say about questions the first question that comes to me is why why are we trying to study this or why data science now I, i'm not sure how many of you would have heard of it but data science is is, is pretty much heard from in every other community that you would go and talk to in different organizations everybody in the current scenario is talking about data science machine learning artificial intelligence and all of it so why is this all this excitement that's something we want to cover once we have an answer to that we'll like to know the other questions such as where does exactly data come from what is data science and how how do we want to do data science how do you exactly do data science and last but not the least the the crux that we want to basically apply and see how data science applies to forensics as a domain and uh, and what exactly are the different types of applications and where can you guys work and uh, show progress and apply data science since everybody over here is from forensic science so that's pretty much the outline of what we'll be talking about today i'll i'll, I'll move further ahead uh, yeah so as any other chapter in any other subject starts uh, with a history uh, and uh, so I'd, i'd like to probably give you a brief on on the history of data science and the timeline uh, not because you have to write this in some exam but just because i want to portray a point over here so if you see the timeline that i am mentioning over here it's basically starting from mid 1700s to early 20th century 20th century that's 1997 now why the timeline is ending in 1997 is because post that post this year anything and everything that has been data in data science is basically an application of what the core machinery or the core algorithm that were developed before it post that there has been a very limited algorithm development but it has all been applying the facts or the the algorithms or the different uh, terminologies that were developed way before that so it's it's like i like i say in the caption it has been around for a while which is what this picture shows so uh, what you see over here in the different timeline is basically are the different algorithms now to talk about each of these algorithms is not in the scope of the current session but uh, uh, i'd like to give you a brief on when and what did exactly happen so in mid 1700s there is bayes theorem that came into the picture bayes theorem is one of the conditional probability theorem now uh, this was uh, given by thomas bayes now this is one of the important algorithm that you would maybe when anybody who wants to de dive deeper into machine learning or data science will have to study so it's one of the uh, very important algorithm there in early 1800s the regression Uh, as a regression is one whole class of algorithms so regression came into the picture now you can imagine how early it is I'll, when i talk uh, uh, down the line when i go further on the presentation we'll see that there is this is one of the very important class of algorithms in data science and regression was actually it actually came up in early 1800s same ways in 1935 1939 there were uh, multiple statistical analysis so one was anova that came by fisher r a fisher 1939 uh, deming gave the quality control which is basically one of the statistical sampling technique so all these years and one of the one of the very pivotal thing that came over here and that is very much in the limelight right now is what you see in early 1940s that is neural networks now neural networks is something that you hear from everybody deep neural nets or uh, dense neural nets or artificial neural nets neural nets is something that has that has somehow uh, uh, tried to cover every facet of data science and tried to be into the picture a lot and this actually came in early 1940s now people have started using it considering that the data has emerged so much and you have huge amount of data to deal with and that is why this algorithm is now into the picture so so basically what this whole timeline shows is all these algorithms were devised earlier and now is the time when we have the data and everything is being used currently so i'll i'll, I'll not waste more much more time into history 
but I'll, I'll try to go further. So now over here, what I started with is why all this excitement, why data science, like what, what exactly is, why do you always keep on hearing from everybody around about data science and, and uh, the, anybody was like, it's, it's, it's like it, at, it is at the tip of everybody's tongue in every organization, the data science. So why is this excitement exactly there? It's because, so if you want to understand this excitement, like I portray, you will need to know what are the different areas or different applications in which data science is coming into the picture. So I'll just give a brief on the applications and then maybe we'll un try and understand why is there so much of excitement. So uh, now in the current trend, like right now in a situation where everybody is at their home and nothing, and there has been so much of lockdown and there's the COVID outbreak, the pandemic outbreak that has been happening, people have tried to analyze this data, the COVID-19 data, and came up with new applications on data analytics. So what do you see on the right side of the picture is basically a dashboard that was created. Over here, you can just mention the name of the country. And for that country, you'll get the confirmed cases, what are the number of deaths, what are the critical cases, how many, what is the death rate, what is the recovery rate. So you'll basically get an understanding of what the current situation is. You don't have to exactly rely on something else, but actual insights got, uh, that is being fetched from the data that is being returned by every country. So when I say this data, this data is actual number of cases that is happening that is coming from the hospital. So it's, it's kind of an application of data analytics. So that's, that's one of uh, why I wanted to put this was it, this is, this is like at everybody's tongue right now. Corona is, is, is quite famous. Now, uh, when I say about a pandemic, uh, if I don't know how many of you are aware, there was this pandemic called SARS. Now, when this pandemic actually happened, there's this complete organization by itself called blue dot wherein they tried to analyze multiple patterns in the data and actually predicted before the occurrence when will the pandemic occur so that's 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 an interesting insight that you could get from the data that you would basically try and monitor and help the organizations understand what is going to happen the next so that th this is like one of the one one another application Further down, uh, now this, another application, if I talk about this, this call, uh, analytics firm there was called Cambridge Analytica. I am not sure how many of you are aware, but in 2018, what this firm actually did was they acquired the data of 50 million Facebook users. Now, why did they do that was basically they used this data to efficiently do a ad targeting i'll i'll not get into details of what exactly an ad targeting it is but the end goal over here for this firm was to basically they tried to influence the us and uk elections so you understand how the implication is at one point of this at at one side we try to understand try to uh, get the data of pandemic and try to analyze the patterns and see what is the uh, probable occurrence when will the pandemic occur where are the most critical cases what is the current statistics and the other side people are trying to use data to influence the elections so that's how uh, how influential or how pivotal data is right now the third point what i mentioned also over here google i am sure everybody knows google google is one of the top notch organization the corporate organization currently now it's revenue around 50 billion dollar that this is the last that i i remember uh, I quoted, uh, I'm not sure what the current revenue is, but the around $50 billion per year revenue is coming from sponsored search. Now sponsored search is something which is again, an application of data science. It's nothing but underlying, uh, somehow you model data science to do this end goal, which is called a sponsored search. And this sponsored search is fetching around $50 billion per year for Google. And that's nothing but 97% of the company's revenue. So that's huge. If I talk about other applications, now I, I can go about the whole day talking about the applications and why data science and what exactly is data science doing right now. But I'll just 
give uh, some of the topics which are which would be relative relatable to all of you so there are uh, uh, i'm not sure if you have heard but there are recommender recommender systems not exactly the terminology but i'm sure people would have heard uh, there are a lot of media platforms right netflix amazon prime hotstar and when you watch something they always tend to return back to you saying uh, we recommend the show for you or uh, when you go and shop in the online platform such as amazon flipkart whenever you buy something there is always an insight that comes on the side which says people who bought this also bought some other product so what this essentially is is nothing but an application of data science so that's that's how how deep rooted is data science so everything around you is an application of data science so similarly there are wireless sensor data so now people have started using alexa right they started using smart devices uh, internet of things is is an application so uh, i'll not get into detail there but uh, people have started using smart applications right the smart acs smart refrigerators smart what the smart essentially means is nothing but it comes because of an applied data science it essentially tries to capture the pattern in which you are using that device and accordingly regulate your usage maybe an energy efficiency maybe it can be any any type of application so that's how how data science is affecting you on a daily level there are text data there are social media data everybody is on social media platforms so these these are the various data sources everywhere there is data science that is engulfed so that's that's how and the very reason why i wanted to put this before getting deeper into it was because now you understand how and why is data science exactly important and why is there so much excitement of people around because everything that you're doing everything is somehow getting affected by data science it there is no industry that anybody can talk about where data science has not played a single role so so that's that's about it now <laughs> when i when i talk about uh, why this excitement now there is this big realization that i just portrayed a minute back and what this realization was that if you if you guys i don't know if you guys remember like uh, maybe a couple of years back 5 to 10 years back we used to have those pen drives which where the storage was around 2 gb or 4 gb at max and that would be enough for us right there would be dvd drives in which we would pass on the movies or pass on the data from one person to another they have gotten obsolete do you know why because the data has like just emerged data has gotten to such humongous amount that these uh, small little uh, or uh, it's it's now uh, these these little drives of 2 gb storage are just not capable enough to store such amount of data so the re- basically the realization that i'm trying to come to over here is that every organization has been growing as of now current right now at this point of time we are at a certain pace where we are increasingly growing and when i say growing there is a lot of data that is already in place with us and there is zillions of data that is piling up now when there are hum- humongous amount of data that is piling up associated is a lot of questions that come up now when i say these questions what do i exactly mean is now that we have such humongous amount of data can this data be of certain use is there some useful information that can be derived from this data that could maybe possibly help an organization and then the other part of the picture would be if at all there can be something that can be derived from this data who is the person i reach out to who would actually use this data and convert it into useful insights now the answer to that is basically data science you reach out to data scientist so now that i've answered that question again there are a lot of more open open ended questions that come up so when i say data scientist you would ask what can we really do with data science like 
what what do you mean by data science what does a data science project how how do you define a data science project to be successful or or when i say that you can reach out to data scientist like how do you define somebody is a good data scientist what are the exact skill sets that a data scientist would require to fulfill uh, the the or to maybe uh, set up a par level so these are a lot of open ended questions i'll try and cover all of these questions in the current uh, presentation let's see how much we can get to so <coughs> now that we have understood why part of the question uh, we'll probably try to understand right now we have talked a lot about data and lot about the applications we'll try to understand where is this data coming from like what are these sources what are the these big data sources now when i say this this is a new term that is coined over here which is big data many of you would be hearing it from some of the other the people there is a different domain altogether which is big data but i would say big data and data science is somehow clubbed together it does not go separate now when i say big data it's nothing but humongous amount or zillions of terabytes of data that is somehow you have to have a capability of storing it of generating insights out of it so how do you do that is basically a capability that is managed by big data now when i say big data we it's it's not the correct correct time to get into big data but what we are trying to get to over here is basically what are these these big data sources like where is this data exactly coming from i'll just pick up some random pointers out of here Uh, at any point of time if you want to ask something like what exactly is this pointer meaning uh, anybody can very well ask so like for example there is media over here the media what what exactly is media media is news all the different news sources that you have currently right can anybody exactly imagine when the media came into the picture i can't media has been ever since i know ever since i recall now ever since then till now there is so much of news there are these are these may be voice these may be text these may be newspapers these can be anything so all of this is nothing but data all these news sources are nothing but data now how do you understand or what do you do with this data is something else what i'm trying to say or portray ask tell you over here is this huge amount of data news coming from media is nothing but data that's a data for us now uh, what do you say about cloud i'm sure everybody is a smartphone user here so you you would either be an android or an iphone user right so you may very well be aware of google drive or icloud or maybe Uh, other cloud services that may be offered maybe azure maybe amazon web services i'm not sure people are you up, if you're aware of it or not but at least google drive and icloud everybody is aware now what exactly is this is nothing but it's somehow trying to store all the data of yours now why do you need these cloud services is because you don't have the capability enough to store the terabytes of data that you're generating right now people just go on clicking photos you don't have enough storage to store all of it and plus also the fact there are a lot of other uh, reasons why but you would want to store it in a secure place not in a physical location that you have so this uh, not exactly a physical location but some server which is not with you but where you can store you can retrieve the data is called as cloud so cloud so sorry yeah so cloud is exactly now when i why i'm trying to tell this is because now everybody is doing that so cloud is a huge source of data you will have terabytes and petabytes of data in cloud so that's that's why cloud is again one of the big data source similarly our internet of things which is basically smart devices as i mentioned before then there are databases now databases is nothing but uh, you can call it as a tool or you can call it as a storage wherein you somehow store and manage your data structured or unstructured data now when i say structured or unstructured data what i exactly mean here is structured can be a data which you can categorize into a tabular form you can put into a table structure where you have rows and you have columns 
these are called as structured data it's a very naive example but that's how i would try to portray right now is these are structured and the unstructured would be the text you can't exactly put a text in a column right you can't be like uh, uh, i have uh, one year news record so i'll put every news as a row any news can be of any amount of length right any uh, so these 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 data are basically unstructured so all of these data are somehow stored in databases so these databases are some is what you call as the storage center of your uh, data so databases are again big data sources then of course the social network profiles you have like facebook twitter you have whatsapp you have so many social media platform and as i said before that organization cambridge analytica it exactly influenced the election with just 50 million facebook users profile that's it so all this profiles all these social media platform there is humongous data that is getting piled up there so that's again one of the big data sources i'll try to wrap this up right now and maybe if anybody has any other data source that they want to clarify and they want to know about i can talk about it in detail later but yeah what i'm trying to say over here is there are lot of data sources and every single source is a big data source by itself when i say big data it just means huge data it just means petabytes of data that's it now <laughs> now this is an interesting picture that i got uh, i i saw some time back i just wanted to put it here because you know like oil is one of the biggest source of energy in 2011 so it was actually coined by in 20, 2006 but accepted in 2011 economic the world economic forum accepted this quotation called data is the new oil you know how important oil is for all of us similarly is is the importance of data that's what this exact quotation means now when i say data is the new oil i'll i'll, I'll give you a glimpse of what exactly this picture shows to you like for example every single day there are 247 billion emails that are being sent by people across the world 247 billion emails every single day there is a, another example that i would give i just give you an gave you an example of dvds right they are no longer uh, being used they may be used but very little right now the internet the web that we use if somehow we could manage all the internet traffic that every user is using every single day this data or the uh, the devices the amount of storage that we would require to manage the internet traffic daily would be somewhere around stored in 7 billion dvds now do you understand how big that number is there are like 5 exabytes 5 billions 5 billion gigabytes of data that is that was being generated in 2011 till 2011 there were 5 exabytes of data in the next 2 years of time by 2013 5 exabytes got doubled into 10 exabytes this amount or the rate of growth of data is ever increasing and that's what this whole pic picture is trying to portray i like this picture because that's how huge when i say huge i am trying to use a lot of synonyms here but i'm i'm falling short of it but huge a human gigabytes or petabytes or zettabytes of data it's you'll just understand the amount once you take a deeper look into this picture okay, how much of data is being generated every single day let's not uh, uh, get more into this you can probably look into that later now we understand why we understand where is this data coming from i mean you need to know what exactly is data science right or how do you define data science so there is a small definition not, not exactly a small definition but it's a, it's 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 a definition that is very much accepted by a lot of communities so data science like any other field it's a, it's a science right but it's an applied science which uses 
essentially three different fields is computer science statistics and machine learning now machine learning can be clubbed into statistics as well but uh, i would say it as a separate thing so it's 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 basically a science which is using computer science statistics machine learning then there are other facets called visualization when i say visualization it just means how do you look at the data like i showed in the previous slides where you want where where there was a dashboard trying to show you uh, the impact rate of covid currently right so that's nothing but a visualization so data science is, is a club of all of these computer science statistics machine learning visualization the last bit of human computer interactions why why is this there is because all this data that gets generated is nothing but human computer interaction right so it's it's a clubbing of computer science statistics machine learning visualization human computer interaction to somehow you collect the data you clean it you maintain its integrity you analyze you visualize you interact with the data to create the data products now when i say data now this is a huge definition to like uh, by the time i reached the end of the definition i was like i i, I don't remember how did i start here but what i'm trying to basically tell you is you have data you have huge amount of data you use that data to somehow generate data products now these data products are of some use to the society to the organization or to yourself or to whatever purposes that product may serve but somehow you need to map data to data products in this whole mapping or the flow diagram data science comes comes into the picture so data science is something which maps your data into data products now in the interior it uses multiple fields to do this whole transformation now these multiple fields are computer science statistics machine learning visualization and all the different things that i just mentioned so that's how i would define and that's how exactly everybody defines data science now given the definition of data science there are three broad categories that you would maybe divide data science into or not exactly divide but all these three categories are by themselves also a definition of data science so these three categories would be investigating predicting and optimizing so when i say investigating it's nothing but analytics it's trying to what the data that you have right now you try to generate some information you try to understand the patterns in the data or what is exactly happening right there it's it's just investigating of the data that you have that's one of the broad categories the second category is predicting now you investigated the data now you know that you have certain data you use that data to basically predict or to predict or to forecast or to say something about the future now that's again a very broad category of data science the third broad category i would put data science into is optimizing now optimizing by uh, its nature it will not come very uh, it's not very intuitive to understanding understand what data science and optimizing is but what i would say is let's just understand uh that for example uh amazon or one of the e-commerce portal is selling a lot of products me or any one of you is a user who goes and logs into this website and tries to buy certain product right now this whole process of buying a product of maybe viewing a product uh, cross checking it with multiple websites or doing whatever you would do and then adding it to a cart if somebody if everybody has ordered i they would understand what i'm saying looking at the product adding it to your cart and then maybe doing a final payment adding an address and delivering it now this whole process is defined right this is already an ongoing process now 
where does data science come into the picture why i'm trying to give you an example here is because i as an user would go to this website and i already have something in my mind that i would want to buy right and i would just obey this process and buy the product at the same point of time now this portal maybe amazon let's just take an ex amazon as an example would try and tell us oh you're buying this product maybe you can also buy this product and and you know why you would want to buy this product because i understand from my historical data that people who used to buy this also bought this together maybe you buy an electronic device and alongside also goes an insurance policy with it now how does this help amazon is because i as a user came with just one product in my mind i ended up buying two so it just optimized their process now it's again one of a very naive example of saying how optimizing is data science but i think it's fairly uh, it's fair to give this as an example of how optimization process works i hope this makes it clear so basically there are three broad categories just to summarize one is investigating which is analytics then you do a prediction of how the future would look like from the data that you have the third is optimizing where the process is already there you just want to optimize those process to get better insights or to get better revenue or whatever be the concern or goal for us so that's how data science is broadly categorized now <coughs> i already mentioned this in the definition but i just uh, this is a visual representation so data science what you see in the center is our data science right so the three uh, pillars i would say is one of the what what you see in the left side is the hacking skills the very uh, very high level term written just for the sake of it but what i mean hack of with the hacking skills is basically you need to have an understanding of computer science you need to understand what data engineering is wrangling data coding well coding is nothing but programming right so these is some of the hacking skills that i mentioned the second part of it is our maths and statistics when i say maths and statistics you basically uh, you remember when i was talking about the uh, the history of data i said about the algorithms that were developed now to understand these algorithms and how do they exactly work you need to have a knowledge on maths and statistics so that's how that's a pillar the third is an experience substantive substantive experience now what i mean by experience is basically like i said everywhere around that you see you would find an application of data science so when you look at something that's that's basically a domain like smartphones or smart devices are a technology sector technology is a domain so when you want to understand data science or use data science in the real time you also need to understand the domain and how does domain now this this danger danger zone that i have mentioned why i mentioned danger zone is because this experience the above the left and the right top are the portions which you would study and get those skills the bottom portion the substantial experience is something that comes when you start working on it on a particular domain but this is again it's an important pillar so that's why it is here now when i say uh, please don't get overwhelmed by the fact that there is a lot of things that are required to cover data science or to understand data science i i i since it's an applied science of, of course it has multiple um, uh, pillars associated with it but to get a basic knowledge of them and to use it in the real world scenario and on a data science problem is not very difficult i would say for example to get when i say programming all you need to know is a, one of the programming language with a good hands on experience let's just say for the fact python and the current scenario to get an understanding of one of the programming language is not very difficult as well you don't need to go outside and look for different courses you have multiple online platforms such as coursera udemy and there are multiple platforms which will give you exact correct knowledge of what is required in data science so that's how you get that for maths and statistics there are multiple books that you could read up they could there are there are courses so for example I, although i have divided this whole data science into multiple uh, pillars 
you would get a complete course on data science by itself which are quite which are very good courses on all the online platforms such as there's a famous course on machine learning by andrew eng on coursera you get any any time i i'll i'll probably post those links and and send it on the zoom chat or on uh, or email it to anybody uh, who requires them but these are like multiple sources where you can get this knowledge from what i'm trying to just put right now over here is i understand there are multiple things associated with data science but to get a grasp of them is not very difficult although it looks huge but it's not difficult you just need to know what to study and where to study it from that's it so <laughs> i i'm i'm sorry for taking up so much of time into answering what exactly is data science now uh now that we have covered three questions now next that we go to is basically how now you know the answer to the question what exactly is data science and why do we require we would want to know how do you do data science right of course i told you to take up some courses if anybody wants to but we'll try and understand like what exactly is this data science flow like to give you a brief understanding of what data science process looks like and that's basically an answer to the question how do you do data science right so think of it as data science is nothing but an analysis right it's just uh, some kind of analysis that you would do you would do a lot of different types of analysis you would do experimentation so this also is one of the analysis that you do on the data that's it now how does analysis begin like any analysis begins with questions right like you ask the right question or you ask any question and to answer to that question you do an analysis of what you want to get uh, the uh, of of whatever you pose the question right so when you have the questions what do you do the analysis of is basically a data so what essentially is a data scientist doing is nothing but clubbing these questions with the data to understand or what i said as the first broad category was investigate the data or to get certain insights out of the data now this is nothing but analytics you would do visualization you would try to decipher certain information certain patterns in the data so that's that's basically what our analytics is now as an outcome of this analytics there are always two options right you posted a question you did an analytics now after analytics you may either be able to answer the question or you may not be able to answer the question right so if you're not able to answer the question by the by your analytics it just means that your data is not enough your question may be right your data is not right to answer the question maybe you need to wait more maybe you need to get more data maybe you need to get a different type of data or maybe you would want to change the question from the current date for 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 the current data that you have so it's basically an abortion it's a, sorry sorry for the wrong word aborting the whole process if the analysis le led to uh saying that the question is not being answered by the data if yes you move to the next step which is called as modeling now this modeling may or may not be necessarily required like i said the first broad category was just investigation so you may just do an investigation you may just analyze the data like we saw in the covid dashboard we just got the data we did an analysis we saw uh what is the current trade what a trend what is the death rate to just understand what how is the progress going on that may very well be one of the question that i want to understand or that anybody wants to understand so it can just be that your analysis is enough to answer the question and you don't need to do anything else so that's your result and that's the end thing or maybe your analysis is not enough your investigative process is not enough but you want to do an advanced modeling because you want to do the second broad category which is called as prediction you want to somehow use the data to map it or to build a a model by itself to predict certain thing in the future now when i say 
build a model. I'm sorry for coining these terms. These are not huge jargons. When I say model, it's nothing but a, a mapping of a function. I'll, I'll, I'll get into detail further, but right now you just understand the fact a uh, model is nothing but a box which takes in the data and gives you what you want the prediction to be as simple as that so to build this box you need to do something you need to apply certain algorithm that's it so you do certain modeling because analytics or investigation was not sufficient enough to answer your questions we so you wanted to dig deeper and you did a modeling process so that's how the data science process looks like now inside modeling there are multiple facets and multiple things which we will try and cover in the next slide now how does a modeling flow look like so you have your raw data now before i uh, uh, explain this whole uh, process what you see over here i try to sync it up with uh, uh, a particular use case now let's just assume that uh, uh, let's just take a use case of uh, buying a house. So uh, some uh, organization has huge amount of, there are real estate organizations, right? So there's real estate organization has huge amount of data of the people who bought different houses or different people who bought different houses at different times on different price rates. There would be people who would buying who would be buying a one BHK property. There would be people who would be buying a two BHK property. So there are people who are buying different types of houses. They would be buying it on different timelines, and they would be buying at different price rates. Now let's just assume that this is the data that we have with us. Now with this data, what your organization asks you to do is basically you want to build a prediction engine or you want to build a model which will predict the price of a house in the future. Let's just assume given that you know what locality is a house in, how many bedrooms are there in the house, what is the size of the house, you want to predict a house price. Now, how do you do that is basically this whole process. So you have the raw data, which I mentioned before. Now, when I say the raw data, you basically have this house related information of multiple users who bought different houses. So when I say they bought different houses, you will always have the price at which they bought the house, right? And when, since it's a house, so you will also have the house related information, which is what, what were the number of bedrooms in that house? Uh, what area was the house located in and what is the time in which the house was bought. So let's just say that these are the three things that you have related to the house and you also have the house price in your data. Now what you do is you prepare this data. Now it can be in any form, right? It can just be uh, maybe uh, user wise information. It, it, it's, it's, you, you want to basically, when I say prepare data, you want to put it in a tabular form wherein you want to put put it in different rows, rows, every row is an information corresponding to a particular house. And when I say an information corresponding to different uh, house, what I mean is every row has information of number of uh, bedrooms being one column, the area being another column, the time or the year in which it was bought being another column and the price at which it was bought being the last column. So basically whatever, I don't know how you got the data, but you basically want to convert it into this form, the tabular form. So that's what the whole preparation phase looks like in the modeling. Now there are multiple things I've skipped over here. There is a pre-processing, there is a transformation. We need not get into those details, but these are one of the process. So it's basically from your raw data into the structure that you require, you need to build a whole flow. So that's what this first uh, leg looks like. Now, once you have the data in the place, what you do is basically you try, you, since you're trying to predict the house price, you build, now you basically try to put an algorithm which will look at the data, 
look at the different it will try to understand the patterns in the data now when i say the patterns as in what is the number of bedroom and the area and the date in which a particular price or a range of price of a house corresponds to so from the huge amount of data what i'm trying to say is on the basis of the multiple things related to a house which we call as features it will try to understand a pattern or the pattern in which the house prices move now to understand this pattern is where machine learning comes into the picture so you basically deploy or employ an algorithm which will try and understand this pattern from the features that you have to predict the price of the house so this is what the second step looks like now there are multiple algorithms that are in the market or that you would have at your disposal one of the algorithm may not be able to predict the price at the correct rate let's just say that one house has to be the price of this house price of a particular house was supposed to be 50 lakhs and your algorithm predicted it to be 1 crores now that's an utter loss to the business right you uh, uh, when i say that the, this house has a price of 1 crore it just means that you put the price of the house at 1 crore and nobody is going to buy it because at the same uh, kind of house somebody would just go and buy it from somewhere else at 50 lakhs why would they buy it from you right so that's a loss to you so basically what i'm trying to say is you try it in a multiple iteration you try on multiple algorithms to see which algorithm or which model is giving you the best result now this is again an iterative process which is what the third step looks like now once you have finalized the model that this model or this box is my best suited box then you just put it into production now it's when i say production it's nothing but an application uh, and again an application is nothing but a box over the your model this box is doing nothing but taking in an input of what is the different uh, uh, the features that we required let's say the number of rooms the area the time and it will take in this information and it will give you the price at which you should list your house so that's how the modeling flow looks like i hope that's clear i know it's it's a lot of step but it it, it gets clear uh, as in one when you keep on working on multiple projects on multiple uh, um, data science projects basically so that's what the modeling flow looks like now <coughs> before going deeper i'll uh, try to uh, give you a very high level overview of when i said the algorithm algorithm is not not a pandora's box right it's 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 straightforward maths which takes in certain information it it somehow maps your data to what you want a predictor or what you want as a predictive variable let's say the example that i gave was the house price so it somehow maps your data to the house price it's as simple as that now to understand machine learning there are a lot of things that we need to cover i'll just give you what are the different types of machine learning algorithm and how do you employ that and when or in what kinds of use cases do each algorithms work to deep, uh, dig deeper into what are the algorithms and different understanding of different algorithms that's definitely not in the scope of this project uh, this session but if required we can maybe discuss it on a later stage so on a broad level the different types of machine learning algorithm are or or maybe uh, the categories that i would divide them into would be supervised unsupervised reinforcement now deep learning is again some of it's it's a very very uh, disputed thing where somebody says that uh, deep deep learning is a different type or is deep learning not a part of ml by itself machine learning by itself or should deep learning be a part of supervised learning by itself but what i'm trying to get to over here i'll explain it but let's just assume for now that this is the correct picture there are four categories supervised unsupervised reinforcement and deep learning now let's get down the tree and what supervised learning is 
like i just gave you the example of house prediction wherein you had the information related to the house and you also had the information of what the house price was in history and you, what you wanted to do was what the house price would be in the future so you basically wanted to predict the house prices now when i wanted when i say you wanted to predict the house price price is nothing but a numerical value correct now this value is a continuous value it can be anything so you want to build a model or you want to put an algorithm which will try to learn certain patterns to predict a continuous value for something it will predict 50 lakhs for something else it can predict 51 lakhs so this class of algorithm are nothing but regression algorithms so that's that's the one sub category of supervised learning the second category is classification now when i say classification i will give you an another example to understand what classification is everybody is used to everybody knows about emails right i'd be surprised if somebody does not but yeah so emails when you uh, open your gmail or your outlook or red i don't know if anybody uses red but whatever uh, email server are you using you would see the emails being categorized into multiple headers right or maybe just categorized into two headers there is a spam folder and then there is an inbox so basically there are certain emails which directly go into the spam folder and the other emails which return and uh, which gets retained in the inbox so essentially what is happening is any email that is coming to your inbox is basically classified into two parts whether it is a spam or it is not a spam so this whole problem statement or this whole structure can be solved using the algorithms which are classification algorithms or these problems are called are classification in nature because you want to predict the different classes or unique discrete classes which are not continuous values so when it comes to continuous values it's regression when it comes to discrete values it's classification now there are different algorithms i can give you examples of each of them but it wouldn't make sense right now because i'm not sure if people you have an understanding of these algorithms uh, for but uh, just for the sake of it regression may you can put in the simplest algorithm would be linear regression in classification you can put a uh, decision tree as one of the algorithms now let's move to the other category of unsupervised learning now what unsupervised learning is is basically you don't know what you want to predict in supervised you wanted to predict the house price or you wanted to uh, predict whether an email is spam or not in unsupervised you don't know what you want to predict you just have huge amount of data you somehow want to get certain insights out of it now in such problem now why somebody would say if i don't know what i want to predict what, what is the use of the data now let's just understand let's just look at through this way wherein uh, you want to understand the behavior of or you want to um how how should i explain it or you want or, or maybe you just want to categorize the huge amount of data into small little chunks because you can't go into details of every single data record maybe you just wanted to you just want to categorize your data into small little or maybe uh, as the example over here I, i i didn't want to get into this because it seems pretty naive but it's okay so you just have let's say uh, a huge amount of data of fruit or you have a lot of fruits in your basket all you want to do you don't know you don't want to predict something all you want to do is you want to categorize or you want to uh, put let's say there are three different types of fruits all you want to do is basically try, divide it, it into three categories so that each type of fruit goes into its unique category you don't know what that fruit is you just want to somehow classify or cluster or group your whole fruits 
into let's say n number of groups sub groups such in such a way that each sub group has similar kind of fruit if you knew what these fruits are it would be a supervised problem since you don't know what these fruits are it's unsupervised now i know the understanding of unsupervised by its nature is not very very uh very clear to anybody it just does not come very intuitive i try and give you one more example here if that makes sense uh let's just think of huge amount of news related data as as i said the data is huge there are a lot of news uh, media uh, news that you have with you some organization has huge amount of text news what i want to do is from this news let's just assume that i uh, filtered from this news data of certain company or let's just assume that i took all the news of past 20 years for google what i want to do i don't have anything to predict here i just want to understand what are the top most words being used in news which are related to google or what are the different types of information that is being contained in google news i just try to visualize what are the different types of words what are the different types of uh, phrases that are being used for google now if the way you do it it comes under unsupervised classification and unsupervised problem and you just segregate the data without knowing what the predictor or what the uh, what the variable is or what you want to predict that's that's somehow called as unsupervised and that now when i dig deeper into unsupervised there are two types of unsupervised problems one is clustering and the other is dimensionality reduction let's not dig deeper into dimensionality redu reduction but i'll just give you a high level overview dimensionality reduction is i have a tabular data i have uh, like i said about uh, house prices i could have 200 columns i could have the uh, number of bedrooms the square feet area what is the bathroom which area which direction does the house face what is the uh, distance of the house from the nearby market there it can be any number of things that i can have information of the data i don't want to use all of them what i want to do is i want to somehow map these 200 different columns into five smaller subset of columns in such a way that all the information that is contained in 200 columns gets covered only in five so there were 200 dimensions i wanted to map it to five dimensions now this class is called as dimensionality reduction one of the algorithm famous is pca principal component analysis so that's another class and the third class is reinforcement learning we will not uh uh big lot into reinforcement reinforcement is a very uh, is a field that's continuously evolving even now what reinforcement by its nature means is it learns on the fly your model uh is nothing but at the real time it is taking a data what the model that you built it takes in the data just take the house pricing use case where you wanted to predict the price of the house you built a model which takes in the information of the house and predicts the price correct right? now what reinforcement learning in a very high level terms would be is you take in you build the model it and the real time in the future it takes the features of the house related information it gives you the price it matches up whether the actual price is that or not let's just say the model is giving the price to be 60 lakhs and the house was actually sold in uh, 55 lakhs so it made an error of 5 lakhs now this error information goes in back to the model and the model tries to relearn so that it does not give error in the future now this whole process wherein you take in a reinforcement or a reward from the environment in which you have put the model is called as reinforcement learning the last bit of it is deep learning which is again uh, these are complex 
neural networks these are again a class of algorithms which i believe could be categorized into either supervised or unsupervised it is just that as i said regression may one of the simplest algorithm was linear regression instead of linear regression you could use a neural nets you could use a dense neural networks to do a simple house price prediction so so it's just a class of algorithm which are since they are very specific to their usage they are being categorized into separate things one of the example would be all the computer vision problems all the uh, all the latest smartphones that you would be using would have the facial recognition wherein you unlock the phone with the face uh, face uh, image processing where you, where you just give the face and it recognizes that and it unlocks the phone so underlying there are algorithms such as convolution neural nets which are being used to build models which will predict the based on the image it will predict certain things or it will uh, match your photo to something else so uh, what i'm trying to get to is deep learning is also one of the class of algorithm but they are being used for a very limited or a very specific field so that's what deep learning is now uh, this is something that i've already discussed in detail in the past slide uh, it's again one of the supervised problem that i mentioned about the house prices how does the model work what is the repeated iteration it's nothing more than that uh, if you want you can maybe look into it later on uh, uh, i already have the slide shared with you people so you can probably uh, uh, look at it later let's 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 go into uh, what exactly is our crux of the day which is we talked about why we talked about what is data science we talked about we talked a fairly uh, uh, high level understanding we took a fairly fair high level understanding of what exactly how do you do data science what is the different flow and everything now what we want to understand is since everybody of us is from forensics how do you use or how do you employ data science in forensics now there are multi as i as i as i mentioned before every domain around you generates huge amount of data forensic is no separate from any other domain so even and when we say forensics it's it's not that forensics is a very uh, very separate domain from everything else right now forensics can be forensic psychology forensic biology forensic uh, cyber forensics like like everybody of you and even me everybody understands right so since all of this is an applied field of the core fields there are data getting generated everywhere like i mentioned before so since we have data we can definitely have data science so in forensics of course we can have data science the first point what we mentioned what i mentioned over here is e discovery that is the core core thing i started from which is why i put it at the top so e discovery is nothing but our dig digital and cyber forensics so in digital and cyber forensics data science has come into picture a lot lately now when i uh, say a lot what i mean is one of the uh, basic things that we do in digital forensics is imaging right imaging and recovering of the deleted evidence and everything now when we do image of let's say a laptop there is there you there could be a point of time when there would be just 5 gbs of data or even 5 10 100 mbs of data right now there would be tbs of data which you would image from a particular device and there are lots of devices that you have to image or you have to recover data from it's seemingly just not possible to analyze this huge corpus a huge data now when i say this huge corpus it can be images it can be text it can be tables it can be any kind of data that you would get or from a particular uh, evidence or a particular uh, digital evidence right so basically data science comes into the picture into over here by analyzing this huge amount of data 
to map it into small let's say a smaller subset instead of a human going through the terabytes or petabytes of data you somehow use it somehow employ machine learning or data science to convert this huge amount of data into let's say a smaller subset which maybe a set of individuals a set of forensic individuals can go through and understand now this whole mapping of the huge amount of data into smaller subsets is again a problem of data science right now when i say this mapping what comes into the mind is an unsupervised class or category of data science that i just discussed about i mentioned about clustering right so let's just say that you you have huge amount of text or unstructured data that get got imaged from a system what you would want to do is you want to segregate this huge amount of text into a small little categories and maybe when you have an incriminate when you have an information about what exactly is the case about you would know which category to look into instead of just looking at the zillions you just look into a smaller subset maybe a gb so that's how clustering or a data science application helps in over here now of course there are multiple other applications over here there is text mining which my core expertise is in is uh, being used to understand or analyze the text actual text instead of just segregating the data you just you analyze the text to understand or to draw out patterns out of it one of the application would be sentiment analysis intent analysis so sentiment when i say sentiment analysis is nothing but uh, uh trying to understand in what aspect a particular information has been written when i say in what aspect what sent just go by the word sentiment essentially can be either a positive thing or a negative thing or it just does not mean anything so maybe when I, uh, or, or to make it more clear if i say i'm a good person that's a positive sent positive sentiment that the text of i am a good person has a positive sentiment i am a bad person has a negative sentiment uh, i i stay in uh, hyderabad it, it does not have any sentiment associated with it so it's it's a neutral sentiment so what what basically sentiment analysis why the, I, i just gave this as an example to make you understand what sentiment analysis is but sentiment analysis can be used to understand or to do a text analysis or to dig deeper into multiple text related information that you would get to understand what exactly is talking positive or what exactly is talking negative about a person of interest or a company of interest for you you can just pick up an organization all the news related to it you can do a sentiment analysis and pick out all the information that are, those are negative sentiments and do further down analysis so it's it's like one of the layer that comes into the picture in digital forensics then again there is a there is a, a a huge area by itself which is fraud prediction or risk analytics wherein uh, there are a lot of data sources there could be credit card information there could be uh, all the banking information there could be a lot of data that you would get from different organizations when i say you would get that just means you will get once if you are a part of that organization so using this data what you would want to do is you would want to understand the pattern of a person who is doing a fraud or you would understand try to understand the pattern of a transaction to basically see if categorize if a particular transaction is a fraud transaction or not a fraud of course is a sub part of forensic science right so if you want to somehow use your transaction data to model or build a model to do a fraud prediction that's use the data science in forensics so that's as as simple as that so that's that's how i would cover the e discovery aspect now of course there are multiple other fields i i i couldn't jot down everything but let's just take for an example anthropology So forensic anthropology wherein you want to uh, you would get a uh, uh, a different uh, 
bones, right? You could just uh, maybe getting long bones on the crime scene, right? So you would want to understand or estimate. There are a lot of people who worked on to estimation of age, or you want to estimate the sex. You want to estimate the ethnicity of an individual based on the bones, or based on the uh, let's just say a crime scene. You did not find anything, or you just uh, in a in a crime scene you just found out an X-ray. Or an MRI scan of a certain part of a body, and based on these images, you want to predict what is what would the day, age of an individual be, what would the sex of an individual be, and what would the ethnicity. There are multiple other things that you could do, but yes. So using this data, you want to predict the age and sex or ethnicity. This is again an application of data science in forensics, especially anthropology. Uh, uh, in uh, the other thing that I wrote down over here was in criminal psychology, wherein you basically uh, try to model the behavior or the behavioral traits. Since psychology, what it essentially does is it quantifies a person's behavior into different different tests, or it gives you a score, right? So basically, when you do a test, you would have a score for an individual. So what it is essentially doing is behavior, as I just talked about, behavior is a abstract term. You can't quantify behavior, but psychology is helping you quantify your behavior. So when you have a behavior of an individual quantified, when I say quantified, a number attached to it, you can use it. Now it has become a data for you, which is useful. So you have the quantified or you have the number of the, let's say a lot of people around, and you can use it to model the behavior or to predict whether a crime will be committed by an individual or not. So that's again, another aspect of French uh, data science. So I'd say these applications are not just limited to this. This is something that just came into my mind. I work completely into natural language processing and text mining, but it's the scope is varied. There's, huge amount of uh, things you could do. But uh, as of now for the current session, I would just like to wrap it up over here. This is what data science and forensics would look like. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll just rest my case here and over to Q&A. So if anybody has any questions, you may very well ask right now. Uh Thank you, sir, for such a inestimable information. Uh, we have some queries for from our attendees, sir. Uh, if you permit, I would like to put forward queries by attendees. Sure, sure. Okay. So one of our attendees is asking, sir, I have heard somewhere about uh, univariant, bivariant, and multivariant. Can you explain the difference between them, please? Univariate, bivariate. And multivariant. and multivariant, yes, sir. Correct, correct. Now, uh, okay. Now this is again an analysis or one of the uh, investigative techniques of this is something which you dig deeper when you dig deeper into uh, analytics, you would understand what univariate or bivariate or multivariate analysis is. And let's just break down this term univariate. Is not uni means single, variate is variable. So when you do a single variable analysis, give, given an example of, uh, let's just say the house price prediction, when I just did uh, uh, what I said, one of the feature of a house would be the number of uh, rooms in the house. I just did an analysis, let's say a descriptive statistics, a mean, what is the mean of the total house, total data that you have. This is nothing but a univariate analysis. You're doing an analysis of a single variable. Now, similarly, you can go about doing it for a multiple variable. So you have, let's say two variables, uh, uh, house price, and you have the number of bedrooms. You want to understand how are these two variables related to each other. So you would try to see, let's say just a correlation between the two, two, uh, uh, two these two features or these two values. Now this is nothing but a bivariate analysis where you are doing the analysis between two, two different features on seeing how do they go hand in hand. So similarly, if you do a multivariable analysis, you want to understand multiple variables, that's multivariate analysis. Now, I hope that that answers the question. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you, sir.
No then another question is, is there any limit for storage of data on a cloud? Uh, of course, there is a limit. Uh, now, when you say uh, the limit, what essentially, how, how do I go about answering the question to limit? It, it's, it's pretty simple, right? When you, you pay for something, and that is the amount of storage that you will get. Like you pay for a phone, which has 128 GB storage. So you can just store for 128 GB. Similar is cloud. It's just that it is cheaper than getting a hardware for you or getting a storage for yourself for just discretionary, especially only for yourself. So this cloud storage is way cheaper, but they also do have a price. Now, when I say price, let's say Google Drive gives you 100 GB of free storage. Now post this 100 GB, you'll have to pay to increase your storage. That's how that's that's I think that would answer the question. Yes, sir. Again, we have a question. Can data science be used in forensic for the purpose of uh, crime scene reconstruction? Crime scene reconstruction. Yes. Uh, I honestly I have not thought about it, but I'll have to probably maybe uh, get back to you once I, I put the thought into it. Crime scene reconstruction. See. All I can say is whatever is the problem statement that you want to get to. Let's just say this is a problem statement over here, where in what we want to do a crime scene reconstruction using data science. Essentially, it has to be broken down into two things. One, you need to have the data for it. Second, reconstruction is a term by itself, but what do you want to eventually achieve or what do you want to target? There is you, you, you somehow have to quantify what reconstruction means. Now, why I was not, why I said I'll have to go back and uh, think and probably get back to you is because I did not, it, it just did not come as an intuition to map reconstruction to a quantified term because reconstruction is a huge process, right? Uh, maybe we can, we can think about it and I'm, I'm right now not in a state to completely answer the question, but it, it's something I can think and maybe get back. Uh, when one of our attendees asking, is it necessary for cyber expert to know more about data science? If yes, then why? Is it necessary? It's not, nothing is necessary here. It's just uh, that how uh, my, my question back would be, how do you define necessity? Necessity comes from what is the need of the situation, right? It's not necessary for a cyber forensics to understand a personal to understand data science. It is just that when you are working into cyber forensics, you will get into uh, dealing with a huge amount of data. Now, when you're dealing with huge amount of data, even currently people are doing it manually, but if there is an option of doing it in an automated way or in a better efficient way, why not go about and learn that fact or learn that part of it. So it's, it's not that it is absolute necessity, but I think to cope up with the situation or to cope up with the huge amount of data that is growing, I would say it's highly recommended for a cyber forensic personnel to understand data science as well. Uh, again, one of our attendees asking, so what is a root cause analysis? Uh, root cause analysis is not a straightforward part of data science. Uh, um, how, how do I answer? Now, root cause analysis is a huge thing by itself. Probably, I'll, I'll 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 give you an article to look into root cause analysis. It's not it's not a very straightforward concept to explain here. Okay, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, again, we have a question. Being a data scientist, what are the areas of opportunity? Sorry, sorry, I didn't get you. Being a data scientist, what are the areas of opportunities? What are the areas of opportunity? Oh, sorry, I actually wanted to say this once I was done with the presentation, but I forgot. Uh, see, opportunities are limitless. Now, when I say limitless, it's not just in the terminology by saying, ki, yeah, there are a lot of things you can just go about doing it. Why I say limitless because I, I mentioned to you proof for it. Every domain around you is using data science. 
So once you have that basic skills required in a data scientist, let's say a basic statistics knowledge, a basic programming knowledge, which by itself is not a huge amount of thing to look at. Its application is in every other field. Like I said, like I'm, consider me as an example. I come from a forensic background, as you're aware of it. I started into data science and was into only fraud analytics. And later on, as I picked up more and more, I diverged into multiple other projects, not necessarily into the same domain. So basically what I'm trying to say is once you have a, a basic understanding and thorough knowledge will keep on improving. But once you have a basic knowledge of data science, the opportunities are in literally every domain. And when I say every domain, I can say e-commerce, I can say uh, anything in technology sector, anything in finance sector, healthcare, forensics, and every sector has an application of data science as simple as that. Again, uh, attendee, one of our attendees asking, so every domain has certain limitations. What are those limitations in data science? Every domain? Has certain limitations. Right. Uh, what are those limitations in data science? Okay. So if you consider data science as a domain, of course, I agree with the fact that every domain has a limitation and data science by its nature also has its limitation. One of the biggest limitation I would say is the data. Although I said that there are petabytes and zettabytes of data being generated, it's not necessary that all of this data would be useful for you. Now, I'll give you a simple example to justify the point that I'm mentioning. So one of the example here would be uh, this, 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 uh, it comes from a project that I was working on once wherein I would want to classify there. Let's just uh, take this as an example. The problem was wherein uh, these e-commerce portals, right? The Amazon Flipkart and all of these portals, they sell in the product, they sell the product. Now uh, let's just say that when we are doing an international shipping, you want to buy a product which is not available in India and you want to buy that product, which is from us. Let's just take that example here. Now that product by its nature is available in us and it can be bought or sold in us in any e-commerce platform. Let's just say a gun can be sold in us market in an e-commerce platform, but you can't buy it in India. It's not legal. Now, when I log into a website from us and I buy a gun, if I enter my location as India, it does not, it should be not delivering here right now. Why I gave this example to you is gun is very straightforward an example, which is it won't be delivered. Now, every single day, there are uh, thousands of products that get added in e-commerce portal. There are actually manual people who try to map which product will be uh, available to which country or not. Now, since these are manual people, they do a lot of mistakes. The same product may be made available in India for let's say one uh, last year and this year, some other user or some other person marked it as it's not available in India. Now, when you have such data, wherein a particular product has been mapped as allowed or not allowed multiple times, your model will just not be able to learn any pattern out of it. Because at a given point of time, your data is saying that this product is available is can be bought in India at another time. It has said it can't be available in India. So it's, so as I say, data is a huge thing for data science. Similarly, data science data is also a weakness for data science and algorithm be it any algorithm, linear regression or a neural network is as good as the data itself. So if you don't have a good data, you can't build on work on a good product or you can't build a data product as a coin. So that's, that's like one of the biggest limitation. Okay. So anyone want to ask any question? Okay. So as there are no more questions, let me conclude the session. Uh, Gypsa Grab team is thankful to you, sir, for giving us time from your busy schedule and enlightening us with your immense informative talk. 
I also thank to Director Sir of Government Institute of Forensic Science, Aurangabad, for his valuable guidance and support. I also thank all our teachers, staff members, and students for being with us in every part of this initiative. I would like to make note that if any organization would like to collaborate with us, we will always welcome you. And last but not least, thank you everyone for attending this session and hope to see you soon again. Uh, the link for feedback form will be given in our YouTube and Telegram channel and uh, it is mandatory to fill it in order to get the certificates. Also, the certificates uh, will be provided to all participants through our Telegram channel. And uh, thank you so much, sir, as well as all participants for being with us. Thank you. Thanks a lot. I hope the session was good. And if anybody wants to reach out, uh, I, I believe some of you may have my contact or my email details. Please forward it to anybody who wants to reach out and have any questions in the future. Thanks, yes, sir. Thank you, sir.